we are here, I think, how many months ago did we do a little uh, little podcast or, or Zoom call with the three of us? Was it like two months ago? Was it yeah. October? Two or three. Literally, I have no concept of time anymore. I am so overwhelmed by 2020. I, I literally have no idea. But how's life, Kritani? Oh, it's been good. It's been good. We, uh, you know, we're just keeping to ourselves, relaxing. <laughs> Both you and I got a haircut. I think it's important to to mention we're getting ready for the new year. It's a new us. Matt Monaco is stuck in the past as always. I got new hair. I Show got your hair, hair, Matt. Show your hair. Show the lack of haircut. Oh. Okay. I got a haircut like two or three weeks ago, and I don't like it that much. So I'll, I'll get a new one probably the first week of January. To be fair, you've been busy. What is it? Is this your first six-figure month or second six-figure month? November was my first. Uh, but this one, I'm pretty close to double it. We're almost multi six figures. So, yeah. You're at nearly 200,000 for the month? Yeah, just shy of it. A couple thousand shy. That's very nice. nice. You've got, you got to go opposite way with it and not get a haircut till your next like red week or red month or something. Just keep oh, it yeah, It's lucky hair now. That makes sense. I, I was doing better before I got this haircut. I've been off my game ever since. And now I have a laptop with like missing keys. I'm afraid to get rid of it now. But I had to shut it down twice during trading today. Like the quotes just stopped working. And that was dangerous when I was trading. That, was CYD. that when you were buying every single OTC I was short today on dips? <laughs> that Possible. Was, was like, Come on, Tim. <laughs> I was dip buying. I, I, I've been traveling for two days, so I've been a little off my game. But I know like ALPP, ABML. I mean, I felt guilty like missing yesterday and CYDY, the freaking perfect. Did you nail it yesterday, Gratani? I didn't nail it. I, I walked, like, I actually thought it was going to hold up. So I walked away from my computer and checked my phone five minutes later and it was red. And so I, uh, I shorted it when it bounced and I got it at 580 and covered it this morning. But you said you had like a record day or record week. I didn't even ask you. I'm sorry. I should have asked you the details. Yeah. So that was last week, actually. And uh, oh. that was so. It was most of it was one position. Um, the day that Bitcoin was broke 20k finally, um, you know, like that morning pre market, I'm like, okay, I've got to find a Bitcoin stock to buy. NXTD, and that was the one, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, so I didn't want Mara or Riot because both of those have like huge market caps and just they've been running for the past like what two three months at this point and it seems like yeah. every time they have some kind of daily breakout it's like daily breakout and then gap down daily breakout and gap down and it's just like like only only recently does it seem like we're starting to get some real like day-to-day -day volatility with them so i was like okay let's look for something cheaper and nxtd was one that you know we've seen run with bitcoin before and only 35 million shares outstanding it was under a dollar when i saw it so it and, and it was on pace for some pretty sick volume so uh, all that plus Bitcoin, like I, I kind of was of the assumption that as soon as Bitcoin broke 20K, it was going to get to 25, 30K relatively quickly. So I was just thinking like, okay, I'd just buy this cheap one and maybe swing for a few days and see what happens. And so I just accumulated it throughout the day. I started with 100K shares, fairly near the market open, um, just about 10K risk on. And then as it kept strengthening and going in my favor throughout the day, I just kept adding dips, adding dips. It had this afternoon breakout where it broke the intraday high and the multi-day level was like within a few tenths of a cent. So I added on that too. And so by the end of the day- I remember because Huddy and Roland were also in chat and they were going long at 86 cents. Yeah, so by the end of the day, I had uh, 350,000 shares with an 81 cent average. And I didn't take off my first piece till 170 the next day. But uh, I completely missed the 210 top. Like I, I kind of thought it was going to keep on going into the next day. So um, midday, you know, it topped out at 210. It kind of weakened and Bitcoin was starting to get weak. So I started to panic a little bit like, oh, no, it's going to just fall apart now. So I sold some more in the 170s and uh, I still had a piece that I was going to take overnight, but it closed really weak and then it was gapping down. So I just sold it all. Or maybe, maybe it only started to gap down briefly and then it was gapping up, but I sold it into the after hours bounce and that's where I got flat. And so that trade was about 311,000, I want to say. And golf claps all around. Thank you. <laughs> but that was also the same day um, that BITW completely collapsed. That uh, OTC Bitcoin thing that went to 200. I was dip so. buying it. I dip bought it in the 80s. It was scary. 
I got short a thousand shares, almost dead top. And uh, but my I covers were good. My I, I covered half of it really, really early. Um, so, but I still I still made like eighty one or eighty two k on it. I think. Yeah. And then so this I'm not too proud of this, but like you know after hours I cover up the rest of my NXT or I, I sell the rest of my NXTD. And I'm like, I'm adding up my profit for the day. And I'm like, that's 393,000. Like I'm so close to a 400K day. So I had this one other position that was meant to be a longer term short. And I just covered it just so I could say I hit a 400K day. <laughs> <laughs> so you still give into the whole little milestone thing, even though you know, I know, everyone knows you shouldn't give into it. You can't help it. I felt guilty about it. But at the same time, I was like, I don't know when I'll ever be in this position again. So I might as well just do it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a fantastic day. It's funny that you were shorting BITW. I was dip buying it. Jack, I think, made like 37,000 dip buying it. I only had like 1,200 shares. It was scary. It was tough to get an execution. It's funny, like these OTC panics, like pretty much all of them I've seen in the past few weeks, like I feel like I'm losing my feel for them a little bit. Like I keep expecting all these fake turns and instead they're just bottoming and bouncing way earlier than I think they will. And it's actually really frustrating because most of the time I'm short and then I'm stuck holding the rebounds and I'm just like, come on. Like, yeah, we haven't seen like the clean, you know, panics in, in like 20, 30% bounces like I like. They've been a little choppier. I mean, a few weeks ago, we saw perfect panic after panic and bounce after bounce on TSNP. Were you trading that? Uh, no, I didn't trade TSNP. Okay, that was beautiful. And then Matt was doing well on that one, right? TSNP, yeah. That was pretty good. I traded it um, through it when I was like going up for the first time on the front side, and then afterwards it got choppy and I sucked. Look at Jack, the golden boy. Yeah, uh, came in. What's going on? Yo, look at his new chain. Check out his new chain. Boom, uh, diamonds. Is it diamond chain? I, yeah. yeah we, I posted the video of surprising him literally like today. I went up to New Hampshire and surprised him. Cool, very yeah. awesome. And we yeah. kind of broke into his apartment, but Love it. it was because his girlfriend let us in, so. It was, it was <laughs> yeah, I had, I had just given her the key to my apartment and the first thing she does is let Sykes, Sykes and all the elves. <laughs> Yo, that's a good lesson, man. Be careful, be careful, come on. First thing she did. <laughs> yeah, first, literally no, it was like a week ago. Did, did you make She's amazing copy too. Code? She just crossed. She just crossed a hundred thousand too. So we have like finally like an upcoming like female trader. No, oh. she. I think she's up like eighty something on the month now. Wow, dude. She's gonna be like your sugar mama. She just. I don't know. Like she. She's just. She's almost like doubled her profits in the last few weeks. But like so have I, which is insane. I mean, you're up seven hundred thousand on the month. Like. Let's just put this in perspective with people. Like you missed Tim Grittani explaining his freaking $400,000 day, which is awesome. Um, just a little perspective reminder. These are literally like the, the best penny stock traders that I know. Most traders lose. So I don't want everyone thinking like, oh, I'm making 400K in a day. I'm making 700K in a month. Most traders lose. They go to zero. We have found rules that have kept us disciplined and these guys, I mean, I'm not even that profitable. I'm up like 130,000 this month. But these guys have learned to really scale. Um, just each one of you, like what's giving you the confidence in December 2020 to really scale? And, and Gratani, I know like you're kind of coming out of a, a multi-week or multi-month retirement. Like what, what gave you the confidence to get back in? Well... I mean, that, that NXTD play was really just recognizing like one very special situation setting up. Um, just, you know, time and experience really. And having seen squeezers like that before when a sector gets hot all of a sudden. I mean, I was, I was very active when Bitcoin went crazy. What was it like four years ago when it was like that November, December where I went to 20K the first time. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of recognizing that, but other, otherwise, um, it's just kind of same old, same old, like the, the shorting, the BITW, like that's basically an OTC short I've done a thousand times. So, uh, yeah, scaling up into this stuff over time, it just comes with experience, comes with consistency, comes with, you know, proving to yourself that you can handle it. Do you think new traders should scale up immediately or should like, how long should they wait? I, I don't know how long they should wait, but definitely not immediately. Um, it took me it took me a while to get comfortable with it for sure. Um, 
I don't, I don't think I even started scaling until probably a year in. And can you tell people like what your early trades were? Like how much do you make or lose like in the first year on your trade? Yeah, like $20 you profit, had a trading $50 implosion. loss, stuff like that. Yeah. And you look back at that and that, you know, starting small gave you the confidence to try it. Then you, you did more trades. Then you got the confidence to take bigger positions. And now it's like, I feel like it's kind of like riding a bike for you. Yeah. And it gets to that point. It's funny, like looking back on it and thinking like, okay, I was in a trade where I was down like $50 and I was shaking. Like I was, I was literally like that amped up over it. Um, it's, it's, it's just really funny how things change. <laughs> And how do you, I mean, now, like, so like you said, you, you, you had a, uh, what'd you have a hundred thousand shares and you said you had a 10 K risk. So just explain that for a second. So you were risking losing $10,000 $10, now. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what I want my typical loss to be. And so whenever I enter a position, you know, the first thing I'm really doing is figuring out what is my cut point on the chart. And then the second thing is, okay, what's the price I'm entering at? And then I just do the mental math of how many shares can I take so that if I cut at this chart point, I don't lose more than $10,000. And I just, that's, that's just the process. Every single trade, it's a risk first you mentality. Still, you still turn off the column on your profit and loss and you're just looking at the chart completely. Yeah. Yeah. I still have unrealized off of my screen. I haven't looked at that in a long time. Crazy. What about you, Matt? Um, well, the realized, unrealized. Like I have unrealized hidden, but the realized I usually keep up once I exit a trade. Um, I mean, you have like three couches now. Couches aren't cheap, so you gotta, <laughs> you gotta pay. Someone's gotta pay for the couches, right? I moved apartments. I sold one, and I gotta get rid of another one. Listen, just, no uh, excuses. You like your couches. We all, we all like different stuff. Gritani likes Snoopy shirts. Jack likes chains. I like sushi. You like couches. We That's all great. have our thing. So whatever works. The couch man for out of all of us, well, Britani and his Snoopy shirts, I think they're like five bucks each. So he can probably buy like Dude. three million. <laughs> he has a Snoopy shirt on. That's crazy. I didn't even see that. Did you put that on for this or did you have it on? I, I put it on for this. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. Sorry to interrupt, Matt. How what what gave you the confidence to really scale the past two months or really the past month? Yeah, so my journey, uh, 2020 is basically my glow, my glow up year. Like, so most all my profits have come from this year. So I kind of peaked in like June, July time frame, and then the market cooled off. I scaled it back a little bit, um, and then going into like September, October, November, like the market definitely started to heat up again. And having just the experience of trading well during like a hot market. Like I've seen my fair share of hot markets. I remember when Bitcoin ran the first time, it's just, I wasn't a profitable trader. And then being able to trade a hot market well, I recognized the signs of it just like heating up and slowly started sizing up uh, in October. And then throughout November, I started just getting the confidence and just start, I started trading well again and plays were running, plays were working. Uh, I, like I'm mostly a long bias trader. So like breakouts started running again. Yeah, which wasn't like a thing in like kind of August timeframe, like they disappeared. Um, and then December, like I talked with Jack pretty much every day and a bunch of traders every day. And I like, I was like, this is the month, like December, like everything's kind of coming together. And if there's a time to be focused, it's like, it's this month because just all the factors of 2020 are all just kind of coming together and the market's hot. So you got to come in every single day prepared. And if you're not, you're definitely going to miss. There's a ton of opportunities. Like if you miss one trade, there will be another, but you just need to be ready and like focused. And that's kind of been my mentality this month. So only couch shopping on the weekends, not during like weekdays. <laughs> on the weekends and at night when the market's closed. So, you know. Oh, online shopping. That's dangerous. Be careful, man. That's a slippery slope. Jack, what gave you the confidence to really, I mean, you just nearly like doubled your entire already amazing year in, in one month while having strep throat and mono. Are you feeling better by the way? Yeah, I'm feeling better. Um, still, uh, still got a little like stuffed up in the morning. I'm still a little tired. Maybe it's just from the weather and, and the mono a little bit, but feeling much better. Well, also your chain is heavier. So like, I, I should have told you, like, you're going to like lean over, you're going to hunch over because you got diamonds now that like weigh you down. I hope not. I just got rid of my, 
my back and neck pain because I would say what gave me the confidence to size up was just getting above the $1 million mark where every single trade I took from when I started, I just was really focused on the money and like the process and really growing myself. And then kind of when I got over like the mark, I just, and this month, obviously with all the opportunity, I just didn't care. And I'm just literally taking whatever the liquidity offers and with my buying power, whatever the liquidity offers, I know where to cut. I know where my potential target is. And if it's not working, I just got out quickly. And it's just about taking the size that the liquidity offers. And basically there's just the rule of thumb that I'll use is 1% of the liquidity on the day is my max uh, potential share size um, on given in any position. So that's it. Well, you just be careful. Like you're, you're scaring me with like some of the position sizes that you take. Like, I don't want to be more than 1% of the entire Dale's daily volume. Like with all my trading, like you're saying on any one position, you're taking like 1% of the volume. I mean, that's what, uh, that's what I'm comfortable taking. Like that's the max, but just, just be careful. Okay. Pride cometh before the fall. Like Gratani's over there smirking. I see him because no, 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 no up as quickly as you have so what do you think about jack sizing up i mean it's working that's for sure like i everything's I, working until it doesn't you know i feel like i've got like a thousand questions for jack because like he's killed it this month and i'm curious what he's been doing like i i don't have time to keep up with a lot of the videos and stuff so like i mean has jack has it been all otcs uh, i would say so and that's like another thing too is obviously like nasdaq has a ton of liquidity uh -huh. so like you the size doesn't really matter, but with OTC, it's just the liquidity and like filling is a lot tougher. And I would just say majority of my profits are all OTC. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, just unreal opportunity this month with, with everything and just all my preparation and experience over the last three years. I'm just focused. I'm always, always focused on OTC. I don't really care about the NASDAQs. So I'll trade them when they come up. But if there's an OTC, it's always OTC for me. And with the NASDAQs, like I'm scared to size up on the NASDAQs. I won't size up on the NASDAQs. Like I'll just take whatever like $500 risk on them because the liquidity is scary and the potential loss is scary. But with OTCs, like, like I know what I should be doing at all times. So it's never a question to me whether I should be cutting or adding or covering or, or buying or selling like I, I know what to do just because of all my experience um and it's not really focused on the the money anymore it's just focused on the trade I, I totally get that that's I mean I feel like I've taken a very similar mentality a lot of times in my career um you know when it's when it's your specific area of expertise like if the opportunity is there and with how hot the market's been this month it absolutely is there um yeah I mean it's, it's awesome you're taking full advantage um, you know, with, with the huge month and really pushing size, like you have, um, have you had like any single loss where like, just looking at that loss alone, you'd be like, wow, this is one of the larger losses that I've ever taken. Um, and did that affect you at all? If so? Um, I definitely made a mistake on LKNCY when it was breaking out. Um, I was bullish on it all morning, but it, it chopped me out when it, it broke low a day, kind of midday. And that kind of ruined my trade on it because, I mean, it was nothing huge, but I realized like a 2K loss on it. And then when it was re breaking out into the afternoon, I just didn't take the same kind of size that I had before. And it kind of just made me emotional. I sold it early. Um, but LK ended up going from like 550 to 750 in the last hour. And uh, I made a mistake on shorting into the the power hour move like it went from like 550 to 650 and it was pretty much all all upticks uh there's like two small red candles and i just shorted way too many shares there it was like 40,000 shares and in my opinion if you were looking at the lkncy price action it was almost like like there was a fund or somebody stuck and like they were just like buying way over the offer at all times um, and it wasn't really like properly dipping at all. Like it was above the upper VWAP the entire time. Um, so I did, I did short, uh, like 40,000 shares, 45,000 shares at like 625 when it turned, um, up there and like it pulled down into like 615, but I was looking for a wash underneath $6 to cover. 
and then potentially go long again for the, uh, for a gap up. And it just held 615 and like it absorbed a bunch of shares at 615. And then they lifted like they lifted the ask at 616. And next thing it was like 625, 630, 650. And I was just trying to cover as much as I could, but um, like I, I was stuck there pretty much and uh, ended up my average cover was like 660 or 670. And I was like a $36,000 loss. Uh, still like that day, I still finished up green on the day. So it didn't really affect me too much. I just knew like, okay, this is my first like big, big mistake this month. Um, and at the end of the day, it didn't, it didn't really affect me as much as I thought it would. I just knew it was a stupid mistake where a lot of the times, like after I, when I took like a big loss back, back in the day, like months ago, even if it was like 5k, 3k, like 10k, like I wouldn't even be able to eat after where I would just be like so sick to my stomach. Um, just because I, I made the mistake so bad, but like this time it was just like, okay, I just recognized I made the mistake. Like everyone's human. I've made mistakes before. And, uh, it just sucks because I, I missed the opportunity on the long side, which was amazing. Um, but that, that was basically it. And then yesterday I made a bunch on CYDY and I kind of got like overly excited for like the next one to happen. Um, AOPP and like ABML when they started like dipping towards midday, um, I shorted, I shorted those just with way too much size, especially AOPP. Um, I think I shorted like 80,000 shares of ALPP in the like two thirties. And I took like a 15 K loss at like two fifty or something. And it was just taking way too much size. Um, mainly just because I was, I was overly excited from CYDY's action. I was like, Oh, the next one's coming. So I better size into it. And knowing ALPP, like I shouldn't even have been full size in that scenario. Um, if I, I listen to my rules, I should never be full size before it like really started proving itself. And, uh, that was just another dumb loss because of excitement. But other than that, it's been, uh, it's been pretty clear, pretty clean sheet. Awesome. Have you had any losses lately, Gritani? I mean, was, was NXTD like your first big trade back or, or have you been like trading? Oh, yeah, like I, I have dabbled here and there throughout my hiatus, um, <laughs> usually with negative results, I'd say. Um, Cause I just, I kind of, I slip into this thing where like, I'll be missing the market and I'll, I'll always kind of have my finger on the pulse and know what's moving. And then when I kind of get a moment where I can like sit down and look and focus, I'll usually talk myself into a trade. Uh, so I, I feel like I've had a number of paper cuts. Like I, I need to update my profitly, which I'll just do at the end of the year and upload everything from August till, you know, end of year. But there, there's going to be a number of like 10K losses in there because I just take a lot of dumb paper cuts along the way. Um, but no, that wasn't like my first big time back on NXTD. Uh, I showed up around the end of November when all those EV plays were running and then had that big crash day. And uh, I probably shorted like eight of those things the day that most of them gapped down and uh, swung them into the next day. And I, I made over 200K on those. Um, so that was kind of nice because that was like the first real success I had had since, you know, I stopped trading full time in July and it was sort of like a good feeling to be like, okay, like I still got it. Like I, di I didn't completely lose like my touch and all this time because, you know, there's of course a little part of me that gets a little worried about that. I mean, do, did you feel rusty like today, you know, I'm, I was traveling back from uh, New Hampshire and like two days I pretty much missed a lot of the action today. I felt like a little rusty trying to dip by because I, I just, I, you know, I, I didn't feel the price action, you know, well enough just because I've missed the past two days. I mean, you missed many like months. Was there any rust or did it just come back? So if there's rust anywhere, I'd say it's shorting listed stocks that are still green on the day, like maybe doing lower highs or something like that. Like that was a really big part of my trading early in the year. And now I'm just really scared of it. And like, I just like, I just can't even get myself to really pull the trigger or go after any. Um, so that's probably the area where I'd say I feel the most rusty, but it's also probably one of the riskier areas to be shorting. Um, the only other thing I'd say I've really noticed is I, I did a really bad job of keeping up with setting price alerts over the past months. Cause that was always kind of like a big part of my process is, you know, maybe there's some big OTC runner or big listed stock runner, and then it puts in its first or second red day. 
And usually I'll just put in a price alert just below the breakout level so that if it does climb back up, I'll get a pop-up alert in my face and I'll you know, just pull it up on my screen and buy it if it breaks out. And I haven't been setting those for months. So with a lot of these OTCs lately that have been going absolutely nuts, I'm seeing them once they're overextended, once they've already had the breakout. And instead of getting breakout alerts and buying them on the way up too, like I normally would be. So I feel like I kind of dropped the ball on that because that would have been a really easy thing for me to do just run a scanner at the end of the day when I have a spare minute and set some alerts and I didn't do it. So kind of a breakdown in my process and a little bit of laziness there. Do you feel any guilt when you see like a big runner that's like running without you? Like, you know, your baby GRWG is, is up to the forties. I hard yeah. to bring that up. I have to ask. I can't even remember how much of that I had. I, man, I might've had like 150,000 shares of that at like, what three four dollars something like that that or like you know like you don't need to trade you're just like you know what i believe in this coming i believe in this story let me just hold a hundred thousand shares I, I just don't have that in me i am just not that person so i no i don't, I don't really feel guilt about it. It, it it's funny looking back on it now um but no i don't feel like guilty about selling grwg really uh when, when i see big plays that i missed if I ever feel guilt, it's because it's like a ticker I recognize where I'm like, how did I not have that on my radar? But most of the time, no. I feel guilt. I drink Celsius every day and Celsius is my GRWG. CELH has gone from freaking four to 40 and I should have kept it. Ah. Do you guys have any of that guilt, Jack, Matt? No? Um, I have a lot of guilt when I miss plays, especially like just for right now, like when I'm so young and I'm trying to maximize as best as I can and, and push as, mu as much as I can. Like when I went to Arizona for like the trip that completely threw me out of my rhythm. And that was like, we've talked about that so many times, but just to refresh on it again, um, I just felt really guilty missing all the plays and made a lot of dumb mistakes when I was really tired and just not in the zone. And like your best trading comes. And that's another part of why I can size up this month is like Oct October was my my new best month going long, followed by November, which is my another new best, best month going long. And then this month's another new best month going long. And it's just seeing that, that steady consistency these last three months, I've really been in the zone. Like I'm in New Hampshire now, and now I'm away from, like I was in Michigan and I was with Dom and stuff and that was great, but there's still a lot of like distractions and stuff um, because we weren't fully focused on trading, but and then I moved back to Connecticut and I had friends, I had my family and they just don't understand. And you can't put in that same amount of work and that same amount of focus with the distractions around, honestly, the distractions. Um, and when I'm here in New Hampshire all by myself and I'm just waking up and I'm trading, it's just, just, it's my life right now. And that's what really just gave me the, the confidence to size up because I'm so in, I'm so in flow with the market that I'm just focused. And when you're not focused is when you make mistakes and you're off your game. So I'll just keep this momentum going until I start noticing that the market's dying out until I start seeing more losses than wins until the momentum stops. But for right now, like I'm just continuing the momentum for as long as it lasts and who knows how long it's going to last. I'll just keep taking it one day at a time. Funny story before, I, before you talk, Matt, sorry to cut you off, but I went to Jack's place in New Hampshire and when Tim Grittani was crossing a million dollars, I went to his place in Ohio. They are like mirror, like identical places. Like it, it was crazy to me. I'm going to post the video of your unmade bed in a little bit, Jack, on my story. because I, <laughs> I think it's funny just because I was in there, you know, and you didn't know I was there. Thanks to your girlfriend for helping out, uh, for getting me and the elves to sneak in. But like, it was crazy. Like, I think there's something being in these towns where there's like nothing and you have like just like a bed and monitors and like your focus like in the zone versus i know a lot of traders they live in big cities um there's a lot of distractions they can't like you know get in the zone all four of us have moved around a lot but i think that we trade better when there's like no distractions i don't know yeah that's exactly my point yeah but Matt's moved the most of all, and now he's succeeding. But now, are you feeling better about your stuff? Because now you're in one city for more than a few few weeks, and now you can really add up all your couches all in, like, one room? Well, I was in North Carolina longer than I've been in Texas. But 
you know, I'm gonna, I plan to stay in Texas for quite some time. So <laughs> that's good. And just like, like, what is it, four moves this year? I mean, you're moving around more than Gritani ever did. Yeah, graduated college. And so moved out, moved into the parents, jumped to North Carolina, and now I'm in Texas. So yeah, this is my fourth place this year. It's pretty crazy. Okay. Do you have any, any guilty uh, confessions? This is a confessional. Uh, no, not so much. Uh, I mean, I definitely have guilt, uh, but it's kind of along the lines of like what Gritani said, where it's like a play that I know I should have been in. Because I can pull up my scanner on basically any day the last couple of weeks and just see some random 100% plus runner. And like that, like that doesn't affect me. I don't care because I never would have been in it. I never would have traded it. There's no pattern. It doesn't make sense. So when I see those, like there's just no effect. But if I'm like stalking a breakout for multiple days and then for whatever reason I miss it and it like I have no one to blame but myself, a trade like that I will 100% be guilty on because like, I mean, that's money I should have made, I should have had, and I for, I, for whatever reason, just missed it. So those are the trades that really get me. Quick perspective, uh, perspective check with Gritani, because, you know, out of the four of us, I mean, he's the only one who's really been around for, for several years. I know Jack talks a lot about experience, but we're talking about, like, three years. Like, I have... I have a lot of things that are less than three years old and you're like, oh, my experience. But Gritani has the experience. How do you compare you know, when you first started nearly, what, it's been a decade or nine years ago to, to now? Like market conditions? Yeah, trading conditions, market conditions, shorts versus long, everything. I mean, with how active the OTC market has been lately, I, it's probably getting close to what it was like when uh, I first started, I'd say. Although it was a bit different back then because a lot of it was like really blatant promotions where now it's like, semi-real companies i guess but what year did you get started i don't i don't even remember was it 2011 2012 yeah 2011 um may was when i placed my first trade okay oh so yeah we're but coming up on 10 years wow it's crazy crazy but it's yeah. interesting because you know it was a crazy promotion market then and now it's a crazy kind of bubble market but obviously your expertise is very different um you know are, are you more comfortable going long now or going short um, it, it shifted throughout my career. Like I, I was much more comfortable long when I first started. And then I became much, much more comfortable short to the point where I was almost never buying unless it was like a daily breakout. And now I'm kind of swinging back towards liking longs a little more again, just because uh, I've gotten better at being patient with them and being selective with them. And I mean, for me as a, as a teacher, forget about just my own trading or, or anyone else's trading. Like I just see so much risk with a lot of these, these shorts, like, you know, they take these big positions and again, you win most of the time, but all it takes is one short to really blow you up. And we've seen several of these like terrible companies go from like two to 20, two to 40 in like a day or two. And I just don't think newbies are prepared for that. Yeah. And I mean, like, the, the big thing with like all the, oh, there's a huge risk to shorting is like, there's a huge risk to it if you're stubborn or if you don't cut losses or you try to fight or any of that. Um, I mean, I guess like you could always get caught in the fluke after hours PR or something like that if you're not paying attention. Um, but there, there is kind of a certain mental comfort in taking a long position and knowing like, hey, this is how much I lose if it goes to zero and it can't be more than that. I mean, just to, to emphasize that point, I mean, you, you're one of the best penny stock traders, I think, in the world, and, and you've gotten caught in some short squeezes where, you know, you took your eye off the ball. So if it's happened to you, I think it can happen to anybody. Yeah, well, and I was in really, really bad habits at the time, and that's part of why that happened. Um, you know, now, I, I think I've been exceptional about it since 2019, like the almost no room for stubbornness or any kind of that nonsense so and that, that's a big part of the reason why like I think my profitability has increased so much in the last few years is because I just completely cut that out of my system is it less stressful now is like trading more enjoyable or do you miss like the adrenaline and like the chase there's definitely less adrenaline for sure um but I think it's also more enjoyable when I do trade because it, it's never a good feeling, you know, the, those couple of times a year where you do get caught and take six figure losses that that's no, that feels awful. You don't want to drop the hammer again. 
I mean, if, if there's time to drop the hammer, I'll drop the hammer, but I'm not going to get stubborn when I drop the hammer. <laughs> well, you won't drop the hammer when it's going against you. No. Oh, no, definitely not. That's that's one of like my that was one of my big aha moments was the uh, if it's outside of my risk level, if I should have cut the stock a while ago, like never, ever, 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 end, ever. <laughs> Why no. is there a tendency for traders to like get more aggressive when the stock is going against them or the position is going against them versus, you know, in reality, if the, the trade is working, then like with your NXTD trade, you, you know, you add on strength. Why is it? flipped for most traders and that leads to like devastating losses well I, i'll say this for for me one of the best feelings i had as a trader like aside from the initial success was probably feeling like so smart if i turned one of those losers into a winner where it was like yeah i got myself out of it i'm such a good trader and that's kind of part of what made that hole so hard to dig out of like mentally, because it was just like, you, I felt so smart. And then, you know, the black swan would come along and I'd get wrecked. So was that like human nature where we want to feel like the odds and stats don't apply to us and we like rise above all that, even though- Probably, yeah. Yeah, a lot of ego. Do you, do you guys have that, Matt and Jack? A little bit, like, I mean, it's tough, like you want to be right. And I think that's where most people go wrong. Is, uh, we talked about this on Twist a little bit, our Stay Trade podcast, where like you just have to like redefine like what right is. Um, and that was like kind of an aha moment for me about a month ago. And I was like, it's not right. Like you make money on the trade. It's right, like how you trade it and you trade your plan. Like that's what's important. Um, and that's why I think a lot of people go wrong is they have the wrong definition of like what's right when they're trading so so like you know if you stick to your plan let's say some uh news or, or something happens in the market and you're you're losing and you you never had a profit and you cut your losses quickly so like you lose maybe a few hundred or a few thousand that's a good trade because you stuck to your plan even though you technically lost money yeah absolutely you agree with that jack yeah, hundred percent. And my rule number one is never add to a loser when it's going against you, just because you're not, you're, you're wrong about the trade. So why are you going to make the damage worse? And for me, it's more about getting more aggressive and adding once you're proven right, because then you're right in the trade. Of course it could reverse and you you're taking that risk of adding to your position and ruining your, or worsening your average. But as long as you're okay with taking that potential more reward for that last win percent. If you have to cut when it comes back, you just need to be mentally okay with that. Whereas never add to a loser when it's going against you and just judge the trade based on your edge and how you traded it. Um, if you bought, if you bought something at, at five and it goes to, you know, 10 or whatever, and you get out at seven, but that was kind of your plan. Like that's a good trade. And, you don't need to feel FOMO if it keeps going. It's just all about how well you can execute your edge and being okay with the results. It makes sense. But what if, let's say you're dip buying like a morning panic, the thing is already down, you know, 30%. And, you know, lately we haven't been seeing one bottom. Sometimes we've been seeing double bottom. Sometimes the second uh, bottom is a little lower than your first bottom. Would you cut losses or would you add? Because sometimes I, I add to my position if I, if I think a stock is feeling out of bottom, even though it's a little risky. Uh, it all depends on the volume, how much it's down, what sectors it's in, why is it down? Uh, Wait, what is you're saying chart? there's multiple indicators? It's not just about the stock or the news? What? I would say there's probably about 30 indicators that go into my mind. But I would say the biggest one is how much it's down and what's the volume. Um, For example, ABML today, I added to my dip buy position and I turned out to be right. I would have had a loss if I cut, but I had a nice gain because I added and took a little extra risk because I thought it was feeling out the bottom this morning, even though you guys were probably all freaking short. Um, no, actually, I, I held my, I've held my short, but I did dip buy it at 108 and sold it at 120 for like a quick scalp while I was still in my short because the overall trend is going down. But for that one minute, I knew that it was going to go up for a little bit. So just hedging it for a little bit and just basically um, just trying, I was trying to cover my short too. And I would say with ABML, yeah, that bottom, it was a little risky, but you had the $1 level right there. If it did fail, that was a good stop loss. 
And if you're in from 108 and then you add it at 105 or whatever, like, um, you know, the risk to rewards there. And it makes sense. It's down 50%. It's a recent runner. It's going into the support level that I held yesterday. So I don't mind the ad there. It all really just depends. Um, like something I wouldn't want to add to a loser is if it's um, a panic that's choppy where it's slowly downtrending and like you keep adding into the new lows and adding and adding and then um, it's just a liquid and it's, there's not much volume. Like that's something you don't really want to add to, but like that straight kind of panic. Um, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I mean, sometimes for me, it's, I just look at it like I, I need multiple stabs. Like on June 30th with CYDY, you know, one of my biggest profits of the year, and I got it in the low fives and then it cracked five. And if I was, you know, totally disciplined, I would have cut losses when it cracked five. But I was like, no, I think that, you know, it's going to stick. And I added to my position in the high fours, and that turned out to be the ultimate bottom. I remember Independence Day, if you remember, when they were shooting missiles at the alien ship, you know, Bill Pullman fired the missile and the first one did not break the shields. And then he's like, I need to try it again. And then he did and he succeeded. Do you remember that movie? You don't remember that movie, Jack. You weren't even born. Do you remember that movie, Grittani? I remember that movie, yeah. I've seen the remake. The remake, the remake is terrible. The, the sequel is terrible. But the first one, I always remember that where like they're all waiting for the missile and then the force field hits, whatever. But then he's like, I want another crack at it. And that's what I think of like maybe it's, you know, you wipe out the initial dip buyers and then it creates the panic that that's needed where everyone else is wiped out. What do you think, Kritani? I, do, I don't like it. I just don't because uh, I mean, well, so it's- I mean, you're also trading the size. It was short going against you, but you know, it's just the, the long version of the problem. And so like, yeah, lately we've seen the stuff like ABML and that other A ticker today where it's like, they're not really putting in the fake bottom and they're just like having their nice clean bounce and that's that. But then look at one like BITW where it had like at least three or four fake turns on its way down. And I've been in the position before, like I used to try to trade these OTC bounces all the time. And I've been in the position where I will, you know, try to add, add, add as it goes against me with the mentality of like, oh, eventually there's going to be a really good bounce to bail me out. And like, if you look at one like BITW, the bounce is pathetic. It was like 70 to 90 or something like that. It was, it was like a really weak bounce considering how far it came down from 200. And it just goes it back went to from 82 to 112. I don't consider that a weak bounce. 82 to 112. I don't. I didn't think it was that good. But it did. It did. It did. Trust me, because I was in in the 80s me. and I was, I was out of the 90s. Um, but it. I don't know. Like it's. Just, it goes back to that. It only takes one mentality. Like you, you're adding to one that keeps going against you. It only takes one that doesn't really ever wind up bouncing. And I, I almost got taught that lesson probably you know six or seven years ago. I remember at the time it was uh, this pump B I Z M where it was up to like five bucks and had this huge fake turn in the threes or something on its panic day. And I was long quite a bit of size at the time for me. And I got almost stuck in it. Like I, I like, I like barely filled before it cracked to the new low. And I was like, Whoa, that was close. Like it was, it was. And then I think I got halted like very shortly thereafter. I'm like, wound up. I think the difference though is like, I'll take one more stab, but if the second stab fails, then I'm out. I'm not doing like three, four, and, five. Okay, so I, I should have clarified, like when I say I don't like it, I don't like it for new traders who like haven't gained the experience or learned, you know, all of these lessons yet. Like, you know, it's we've been around the block. Slow. So we kind of have a little bit more flexibility, I think, to bend the rules and get away with it. But yeah, if no, you're new and you're slow. trying to bend the rules, it's very easy for that to snowball and turn into a huge problem. Yeah. You know, Pirates of the Caribbean, Parlay. It's not, it's more of a guidelines, really. <laughs> Have you seen that movie, Jack? Pirates of the Caribbean? Mm, I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, but I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I do a terrible accent, but no, you're right. It is a slippery slope. Um, uh, I think a, a, a second point to clarify is that Gratani, Jack, and even now Matt, you know, you guys are taking big size. I take like minuscule size positions where I can usually get in and out. I mean, ABML was like my biggest size in quite a while where I had like 40,000 shares. It was like a $50,000 position, but usually I'm trading with like 10 or $20,000 positions. Um, and I'm trying to make like one, two, three grand. You guys are sometimes taking, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500 thousand dollar positions. So there's different games being played. Yeah, no, I would say that, like, honestly, my like what I'm saying, like as of recently and stuff, like it's not even really good advice for anybody, um, like out there that's new. Like I would listen to like what Gratani says, 
and even what like Matt's been saying has been really good too. But like, honestly, my advice is just like, I'm just saying what I've learned so far and like my process, but Gratani has, you know, been here for almost 10 years now. So he really knows what to, what to say on these and what to tell people. Um, but for me, it's like, I'm just saying kind of what I'm learning. And I don't think like a lot of people should be trying to like emulate what I'm doing at all. Um, just oh, because I'm everyone. learning as I go too. And I'm sure I'm going to have some lessons along the way um, because you always have to adapt. And there's always going to be a lesson about, about something. Yeah. I mean, all, all anybody can do is, is learn what works for them. Like we all share our experiences openly, not so that anybody follows anybody's alerts. You should never do that. Not to like try to copy someone exactly, but just to see, you know, what works best with your personality. You have to understand most newbies are trading with like a hundred shares, 200 shares. Um, you know, they have a limited number of day trades. So that comes into a factor too. Like sometimes I see these people dip buying and they can't even get out same day. And I think that's dangerous because, you know, what if you do get one of these slippery slope um, stocks where it just keeps dropping like WSGF, you know, drop like 70, 80% on the day. And you're like, well, I have to hold because of the PDT. So I think that people should always um, save an extra trade and be able to get out whenever they want, whether they're uncomfortable, whether they're lost, grows too much. Um, you don't want to have to be stuck in a stock because you just don't know what's going to happen. There can always be one play that just gets out and then you lose, you know, big or, or even all your money or even more than all your money if you're shorted. And that takes you out of the game confidence wise. Totally. Cool. All right. Gritani, fast, last 10 minutes, you get to ask all of us questions. Anything on your mind? This is Gritani's Q&A. Okay, uh, Sykes, do you ever short anymore? I shorted, I think, three, two or three times in 2020. Jack was like cheering, yeah. like the whole chat room was like cheering when I shorted. Um, I shorted WRTC as, as I remember one of the last ones uh, when they, they had a failed LAPD trial. I made my 50 cents, I got out, the stock dropped two bucks a share on the day. I also shorted ADOM because it was just up too much. And I, did, I think I cut losses quickly. Um, or maybe I took a small game, but it was pretty much a scratch because I was just, it was just a crazy EV run up, but I don't like shorting for newbies because, you know, some of these short squeezes can just run up again and again, um, more and more than ever before. So it's scary. So you're, you're just avoiding like the shorting, these crazy extended OTCs, like that doesn't, that doesn't like hurt your past life to him. I mean, for me, I, I, I see all these runners, like I, I was at ALPP. I mean, when they first announced the drone acquisition, like I, I was there at the beginning. I, I, I know it's overextended. I know ABML is overextended. I just don't know how high they go. If you had asked me on the last like 10 runners, how high they would have gone, I would have been wrong on all of them. So I, I just am scared. Gotcha. Um, Matt, what, what is your favorite set of Matt? Um, I like OTC breakouts, it's definitely my most profitable. And then kind of like a variation in listed land is like kind of like the ABCD pattern into the afternoon. And then as it breaks high day um, and multi-day breakouts enlisted. So just like breakouts. For the breakouts, do you kind of do like a price alerts thing like I do, or do you more just watch your scanner and just keep pulling up daily charts really frequently? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm sure if you look at uh, my, both my stocks trade in think or swim. Like I've got so many alerts and some of them are like two, three years old now and they just never broke out. Um, but yeah, because those are, alerts are super important because you, you if one random day, it just might shoot up towards the breakout level and then hold up and then break out. And if you're like, it might not even hit like your normal scanner. So it's definitely an important thing for people to throw up there. Cool. Um, Jack, are you going to, win that fantasy football championship this weekend i hope so but the guy that i'm playing uh scored like 190 on me when we played it when we played so i'm kind of kind of scared of him and uh stefan diggs is injured might be injured and he's been doing really good for me this year so i don't know my team's kind of shaky when like when when i have injuries my team like scores barely 100 and like when they're healthy they'll score like 130 to 150 so like I've been consistent all year and that's why I think I'm in first place, but like, I, I can't, like, if he has another huge, huge, uh, run, like I won't be able to compete with them. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> are you guys talking awesome. about each other? Cause I'm not in this little league. I don't have time to waste, but I feel like you guys are talking about each other. 
No, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a real stocks question, Jack. Um, could you actually tell me a little bit about your CYDY short yesterday? Um, like, I know it kind of like, well, just like, were, were you not shorting until it like did that lower high and kind of sideways action and then cracked? Or did you not get um, short until the big bounce after it went red? Like, at what point did you get in and then were you just covering on that turn near five? Yeah, so CYDY, I remembered from the first run, if you if you look at the daily chart, it was both times both times like seven green days. Of course, this time it wasn't as overextended, but it was going into resistance, which kind of makes it ideal. Um, and I just remember that it topped out exactly at ten. So when I saw it at seven bucks, I started actually shorting it at the six nineties. And oh. just being just being conservative, I did cover like into the VWAP dip at like six seventy, but that immediately gave me like a four grand cushion on it. And just using that that four grand cushion, I was waiting for it to kind of fail. And I actually didn't even reshort it because I didn't want to get it chopped up in it until like it was confirming. And then once I started taking out 650, um, I just started like slowly just five 10k shares. And then just as I kept failing, just more, 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 all the way down oh, to so green. You're field. adding as it's like falling apart. Yeah. And then just yeah, risking, cool. I think my average was like 50,000 from 622. And my average was if it held there, I would just cover as much as I can into the churn and just get out. Um, but then I saw like the offer stack up like 500,000 shares at like six bucks and we went red. And just knowing too how CYDY operates, um, it was like almost identical to the last friend. And when I took out green to red, we got that panic right to five bucks again. And I was patient and I did cover my shares at uh I did cover my shares in the low fives. It wasn't perfectly like in the turn, like I was covering 520, 540. Just uh -huh. making sure that I, I have my buying power, I have focus on my E-Trade account to buy the dip. And then I did buy the dip and I, I nailed the dip buy with like 96,000 from 511. And I just honestly got scared because it was way too, it was like the biggest size I've ever taken. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I sold that at like 535, 540. Um, but obviously it, like it kept going and like, that was just a little bit too much size for that. And that's why I got out quickly because I wasn't, I wasn't, um, feeling comfortable. And then, uh, I reshorted 50,000 shares at 590. I nailed the top on the bounce, just risking green to red. And, uh, and then I covered on the dips along the way and I got out the bulk of my size at 525 and I didn't swing it. Nice. But, uh, that was my trade on it so like it's it's just trading basically like the action that i best like long and short best that i can very nice why yeah. do people think that there's like a short selling conspiracy on on cydy like i get tagged in these ridiculous tweets when all you have to do is study the patterns like this is a classic four five six crash drop dip buy reshort i mean it's the same pattern over and over why why do people not do this like Am I taking crazy pills? You guys see it, right? Like we don't we don't even talk to each other. Like I've I've never shorted CYDY. I tried to dip by it a few times. I I made some good money, but like why do people think that there's more going on rather than just recognizing the price action and patterns? Well, people people drink the Kool-Aid. And so when they when they believe that, you know, CYDY is the greatest company on earth, the only possible explanation that it would go down is short attack. Like it's, you know. But what if you look at the pattern and you show them 20 examples with the exact same pattern? Do they just not see it? Do they not want to see it? I think they say, but this is a real company. Like it's, there's, there's no helping those people. There's nothing you can do. But it's do. the same pattern. Like if you show the same pattern, like it's 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 the same it's the same i don't know how to explain it any other way at, at a certain point you know just just relax and what will be will be <laughs> i like your I, your giving up the fight. approach i I'm wish i could up. be i just keep linking the same patterns i'm like just read it maybe do you think they're illiterate do you think that's possible like promoters maybe they do too much coke maybe like they're just illiterate and they they never got taught like how to read we're just in a weird conspiracy theory society where people would rather believe the crazy explanation than the simple one. That's just kind of where we're at. Well said. That's that's how we'll end it. That's that's a great uh, ending. And, and I, we can be wrong in any trade. All of us have done very well, especially lately. But again, let me just remind people: most traders lose. We're partaking in patterns. 
where you know we think that we have an edge, but we are willing to cut losses quickly. None of us win 100% of the time, 90%, 80, even 70% of the time. Like Jack is making what 700 grand this month, and your winning percentage is 60% still. Is that right, Jack? Uh, well, first of all, I I don't think I'm up. I think I'm only up like six, like 70 or 80. Um, oh my bad, 670 thousand, not 700 thousand. My bad. But, but uh. You said you had 35,000 unrealized. That'll push you over 700. Well, what if it gaps up and squeezes me? So you can be wrong in any trade. Okay, I like that. So you made 670,000 realized, you have 35,000 unrealized, but your win rate is not 190, 80, no. 70%. No, but I think my win rate this month, just based on the opportunities, I think it's more like 70, 75. And it has been higher in November too, and even in October. Okay, and, but you're uh, going against my point, okay? like. <laughs> the point is that you can lose. You have to cut losses quickly. You know, we don't know everything. Discipline matters. That was my point, but you're messing it up. Yeah, no, discipline definitely matters for sure. And like, it's okay to win. Like I've lost 10 trades in a row when it's slower and just make sure to just recognize the momentum. Like getting back to what I said, it's all about the market conditions. And like when things aren't working, like things aren't working. So you should be scaling down on size. And then when things are working, like that's when um like just keep trading that momentum until it stops working and then when it stops working you don't have to fight and say i'm always right like you don't need to win every single trade it's just about playing that momentum the best you can just kind of like basketball where like you score 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 and then like once it stops like you're gonna have to play defense the best you can until you can build that momentum again and i'll i'll give a 20-year example where i made a little over seven hundred thousand dollars the first four months of the year 2000 um, all OTC breakouts, you know, unbeknownst to me, there were OTC boiler rooms going um, around, calling everybody at dinner time that led to gap ups that I was just following the pattern. But the first four months, I made over 700 grand. The last eight months, I lost 10 grand because there were no more OTC breakouts that actually forced me to short sell or learn short selling, which was actually good. But the market can and will change. Don't get too comfortable with any hot market. Um, just take it for as long as you want. Gritani, you get the final word because you have the trade of the month making over $400,000 in a day. Final words of, uh, of wisdom from the man. Um, geez, I've done this so many times. I don't even know what I haven't said yet. Um, you, don't, you can repeat yourself. It's, this, is, this is what I want people to understand. This is not rocket science. There's a lot of learning in the beginning. And you know, all of us have put in a lot of time studying, but after a while, it's the same patterns, the same rules, the same lessons, and it's just reinforcing it. So feel free to say the same thing, whatever's on your mind right now. Um, I think the big thing lately for me is just data, 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 like track everything. Like that has helped me so much. Like whether it's tracking my trades and figuring out where do I succeed, where do I fail? Whether it's, you know, tracking a setup that I learned in a video lesson and wanting to see, oh, how does it actually perform? How can I improve upon it? or maybe just something I think I see repeat a few times in the market. And then I say, okay, every time I think I see this, I'm just gonna track it. Like, you know, just having that data at your fingertips and being able to play with it and figure out like, oh, you know what? The ones with the higher market caps don't work so well, or, you know, just like random things like that. Like you can, you can just gain so many little insights. So uh, I'm all about tracking and yes, it's extra work, but it is extra work that I think is well worth it. At least it has been for me. Cool. And I hear in the rumor mill that you're working on a new guide. Care to comment on those rumors? I'm bringing that up. Okay. Yeah. Um, trading tickers too should be out end of January. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Woo! Yeah! Woo! I'm excited. Boom. On that note, thanks, Tim. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We, if you didn't want to talk about it, we could have cut it out, but you, you oh, went no, with no, it's it. Fine. It's fine. It, look at your face getting all red. I love this. <laughs> I am so pumped. You have no idea because literally you and now Jack and, and Matt and, you know, more and more people are taking this game into, you know, new areas and like you with the data, that's something I've never done. So I'm excited to watch it. So happy uh, 2021. Let's make this uh, a better year than 2020, but thank you guys for you know, sharing everything for being, you know, great parts of like the community, just helping others. Like literally this is my, been my dream since the beginning. And I'm so proud of you. And I'm so excited to see what more you guys can accomplish. Just stay humble, 
don't get cocky. Don't buy so many couches like Matt Monaco does. <laughs> <laughs>